Don't you think it's time for a generational change? When you're not feeling well, the younger ones can take over, and there are plenty of replacements for an old woman like you. Exactly. Let the young people handle all the work. I was on the receiving end of such sarcastic remarks again today from Ingrid, my boss who is about 10 years younger, and Tanner, a member of the executive team. I never thought just doing my job would subject me to this much criticism. To be honest, I was feeling at my limit, and even the job I loved was starting to become unbearable. Understood. Then I quit. I won't be coming in from tomorrow. I left my pre-prepared resignation letter on the table and quickly left the office. Whatever happens to that company from now on, it's not my business. Feeling a sense of relief deep down, I realized I was at peace with my decision. My name is Sophia, a 55-year-old single mother. My ex-husband had an affair in his 30s, leading to marital strife and eventual physical confrontations. So I divorced him to escape from him. My daughter Sarah, who was still in elementary school at the time, remembers those days. She told me how hard it was for her to watch, which was confirming to me that getting divorced was the right decision. Afterwards, I threw myself into my work to raise Sarah, hopping from job to job as businesses closed. I was careful not to fall ill, but I had to do everything I could for Sarah's future. I want Sarah to have as many experiences as possible, good or bad. I don't want being a single mother take her happiness away. That's something I've always wished for, even after she became an adult. But Sarah started staying home more, concerned about me. She has been helping around with house chores since she was little, which made her more mature than her peers. I've asked her if she was overexerting herself, but she always smiles and says, If it can lessen your burden, mom, it's no problem at all. What a sweet child. To be able to witness Sarah's growth up close and feel happiness. It's a reminder that I can't become complacent in our situation. Sarah's long-term boyfriend also made me feel this way. When he came over to greet us, he turned out to be a kind man who even helps with household chores. This is why I needed a self-improvement as well. But honestly, I was worried that my age would prevent me from getting job offers. Although luckily, it seems I've managed to find a company that values the administrative sales skills I developed in my previous job. Plus, it's conveniently located near our apartment, just a 10-minute walk away. With supermarkets lining the streets near our apartment, we're surprisingly well off. When I told Sarah that I had landed a job in sales, which I'm particularly good at, she seemed very relieved. I remember I was around 43 years old when I joined the company. Being considerably older, I felt like not being one of the younger new hires was a disadvantage. However, upon entering the company's meeting room, I saw another new female employee. We exchanged polite nods, and she smiled and bowed in response. At that time, we interacted as fellow new hires. Her name was Ingrid, aged 33. Now, 10 years later, she's my boss. Despite the 10-year age gap, I couldn't help but think she had been raised well based on how gracefully she sat in her chair. She always had a subtle makeup, her smile was so charming and I envied her for it. I thought she was such a nice girl and looked forward to getting along with her. Just talking with Ingrid was enjoyable. I wondered when was the last time I felt this way about someone. Honestly, I had a very good impression of Ingrid. But perhaps it was too early to judge someone without knowing their character. After joining the company, I went through proper training and started working alongside my colleague Ingrid. She talked about her college days and hoped to utilize what she had learned. She really was a hard worker. Seeing Ingrid so dedicated to her work inspired me to do my best. As the busy days went by, before I knew it, about five years had passed. One day, during a morning assembly in March, our boss at the time said, I have an announcement to make to everyone. Ingrid then stepped forward, smiled gently, and bowed. Starting from April, I'll be taking a leading position. Please, I'd appreciate all of your support. After Ingrid finished her greeting, there was a round of applause from all the employees. Becoming a manager wasn't uncommon. Yet, why did it seem like all the employees were on Ingrid's side? I had my doubts, but it seemed appropriate to celebrate this moment. I too clapped louder than usual, congratulating Ingrid on her new role. By April, when Ingrid turned 38, she had smoothly transitioned into her role as the manager overseeing all staff. As a former colleague, I no longer had to be cautious around Ingrid, who had been promoted earlier. 
However, since Ingrid's promotion, she started to look down on me. Whether it was work-related or even during breaks, she would dump loads of documents on me. You have a longer career than I do, so you should be able to finish this easily, right? Good luck, Sophia. Ingrid said this with a dismissive laugh as she handed me the work. Furthermore, upon checking the documents, I found resumes of new hires, which made me wonder if she intended to give me a recruitment role. I couldn't understand what she was thinking. The documents contained many items necessary for administrative work. Not just the tasks I was originally supposed to do but also duties as a recruitment officer, and it seemed she wouldn't listen to any complaints I might have. However, my previous boss had recognized my skills. Thanks to him, I was entrusted with administrative sales tasks. I felt immense gratitude towards my previous boss, who focused on developing each person's skills based on their strengths. With gratitude, I have been making an effort to complete my work diligently. I couldn't help but to think that dumping work on someone without considering their feelings was questionable. Moreover, some of the documents included tasks that Ingrid was supposed to do herself. What is going on? Confused, I decided to ask Ingrid about it. However, the words that came out of her mouth were unbelievable. You've been working longer than I have, haven't you? If you can't do this much, there's no point in working at all. The notion of Ingrid delegating her tasks to a subordinate. Moreover, the excessive amount of work started to stir anger within me. But causing a scene would solve nothing. I managed a gentle smile and said to Ingrid, I see. You gave me the work because I've been here longer, right? But don't you think it's odd to pass your own tasks on to someone else? Ingrid, looking smug, scoffed at my words. I am your superior. I'd appreciate it if you'd stop talking back. What kind of attitude is that? Ingrid's demeanor had changed completely since she was promoted. It was as if she had become a different person. The reason for this change would become clear later, but at that moment, I had no choice but to suppress my anger. I wanted to voice my complaints, but being an employee, I couldn't afford to be fired. Despite my mixed feelings, I had to endure. One day, we were informed during the morning assembly that an executive will be visiting. An executive, huh? I wondered what kind of person they would be. Then, just after 10 a.m., an unfamiliar man walked in. He was dressed in a black suit, with his hair neatly styled. He didn't look flashy, but his sharp gaze was somewhat intimidating. Standing before the employees, he introduced himself as Tanner, presumably around the same age as Ingrid. I will be serving as an executive here. I've been assigned to this company starting today. I look forward to working with you. Tanner bowed politely and flashed a business smile, charming many of the female staff. It was hard to imagine anyone not liking him at first glance. However, based on my experience, men like him are always two-faced. I thought this because my ex-husband too had a charming smile. He was considerate, willingly participated in household chores, and seemed kind. Yet, I discovered his infidelity while preparing dinner one day. Overhearing a call he claimed was work-related but was actually with another woman. If it had been work, his expression would have turned serious. But instead, he looked happily engaged. This led to a confrontation, fights, and eventually divorce. Fortunately, I had consulted a lawyer before our divorce, leading to a successful claim for compensation in the divorce settlement, which helped me raise Sarah until she came of age. In a way, I had to be thankful to my cheating ex-husband. Back to the story about the company, it seemed that Ingrid, my female boss, and Tanner, the executive, started spending more time together. I wasn't certain, so I decided to ask one of the employees during lunch break. It turned out that Ingrid and Tanner were indeed in a relationship. So, they were considered a couple in their 40s. From my perspective, they were a couple 10 years younger. I didn't want to interfere with their romance, but they were openly flirting in front of everyone regardless of whether it was during work or in their private time. Honestly, I wished they would save such displays of affection for outside of work. It felt like they were flexing their relationship. While recalling the times with my ex-husband almost brought me to tears. Ingrid approached me, boasting with a proud smile. Despite everything, Ingrid and I were former colleagues. We both liked to speak our minds, so we often had honest conversations. However, Ingrid looked down on me with a sense of superiority, reminiscing about when we first joined the company. 
as Ingrid and Tanner took on their new roles, and another five years passed. I entered my fifties and suddenly started experiencing pain all over my body. Thanks to that, I ended up going to the hospital, where I was prescribed medication. Without it, I would have been unable to maintain my health. For example, if I said I was feeling unwell and needed a day off, I'd be called an old person. And if I asked for help because I was struggling, I'd be told that after working for so many years, I should be able to manage. I wished they could be more considerate. Would speaking out get me fired? There are cases where people are let go at the whim of their boss. To make matters worse, Ingrid publicly announced my age to all employees, portraying herself as a young and attractive woman. Just as my anger was reaching its peak, Ingrid and Tanner came over to my desk, with Ingrid rudely sitting on it. Glaring sharply, Ingrid mockingly laughed and said, Scary! Tanner, standing beside her, believed only what Ingrid said and looked down on me. What do you want? I asked, listening to their request. However, the words that came out of their mouths were unbelievable. Don't you think it's time for a generational change? After all, the young ones should be doing it, and there are plenty of replacements for an old woman like you. Exactly. The work should be left to younger people like us. Hearing this, I was shocked. But I realized it was better to leave such a workplace. Looking at them, I smiled broadly and said, Understood. Then I quit. I won't be coming in from tomorrow. I left my prepared resignation letter on the table and quickly exited the company. Whatever happens to that company from now on is no concern of mine. Thinking this, I felt a sense of relief deep inside. Upon returning home, I immediately contacted not only Sarah but also my best friend, Karen. I just wanted to feel at ease now. I wanted them to hear about what happened at the workplace I had just left. When I called, both of them encouraged me, saying, You did well! And I couldn't stop the tears of joy. Sarah mentioned she had an important job to finish but would come over as soon as she was done. Meanwhile, Karen said she'd come right over, so I'm currently waiting at home. About an hour later, the sound of the doorbell woke me up. I had fallen asleep waiting. Perhaps due to the exhaustion from work. Peeking through the door's peephole, I saw Karen standing there. When I opened the door, Karen hugged me, looking worried. What happened? What do you mean, what happened? I've been telling you since high school to consult with me before reaching your limit. Karen was visibly upset. Almost like a mother to me, which made me burst into laughter. She's so kind, like a reliable sister, it's comforting. But I knew this wasn't the time to be fully at ease. Since it was because of those two that I had to quit my job. If I want Sarah to be happy, it would be wrong not to stand up now. As a mother, I should be able to overcome even the greatest obstacles. It's okay, I'll be okay. Watching me try to regain my composure, Karen, who knows how to be polite when guests come over, said she'd like some tea if I had any. I hurriedly prepared the tea and poured it into cups. You haven't changed, Sophia. Eh, what, is that a dig? No, no, I meant it in a good way. Being told this at such a time was mentally challenging. If it was meant positively, then there's no issue. I prepared my own cup of tea and sat on the sofa. So, can you tell me about this former colleague and the executive? Karen's serious look made me realize. She wanted to hear the whole story. I decided to tell Karen about everything that had happened with Ingrid Tanner. How Ingrid, who was 10 years my junior and a former colleague, became a boss at the company. How Tanner became an executive at the same company around that time and how those two apparently started dating and then my harassment increased. After hearing everything, Karen became visibly upset, her fidgeting intensifying. A habit of hers when she's angry, which she has had since we were young. Her husband has told her to work on it, but it's a hard habit to break. Knowing Karen was angry on my behalf was comforting. I wasn't the only one upset. Caught up in my feelings, Karen suddenly grabbed my shoulder and said, Come work at my hotel. What? I was taken aback by Karen's sudden offer. Indeed, I had worked at Karen's hotel a long time ago, back when I was in my thirties. It's been about twenty years since then, so I assumed Karen's parents had forgotten about me. But that's what I thought. Karen mentioned that her parents wanted to hire me, believing that the hotel would become livelier with me there. The work at the hotel wasn't just about sales, it included cleaning, cooking, and working at the reception. 
I had experienced a variety of tasks there, and I truly enjoyed that time. It was very gratifying to be thanked with a smile by guests as they left. I had been hoping to do it again, so this offer was very welcome and appreciated. But, was it really okay? Would moving to another job so soon after quitting my previous one not be a bother? Even if they welcomed me, I didn't want to end up being looked down upon like I was before. When I voiced these concerns, Karen reassured me that since it was her parents' recommendation, I didn't need to worry about that aspect. Feeling assured that I could work at the hotel without worry, Sarah returned home. I explained the situation to Sarah, and she became as angry as Karen had been. I won't forgive those two. Mom deserves to be happy, she said. Thank you, I said, hugging Sarah. I also mentioned that my next job might be at the hotel where Karen serves as the manager. Sarah responded with enthusiasm. I'll do it too. Apparently, she had decided to quit her job as of tomorrow. With that settled, Sarah and I began to prepare. Karen mentioned that there was a dormitory near the hotel for employees, rarely used, and offered to show us. I'm fortunate to have such a great friend. Karen is too good for me. While feeling moved, we managed to get most of our preparations done. The next day, when the doorbell rang and I opened the door, there stood Ingrid and Tanner with distressed expressions. What do they want? If they were here to complain about not being able to handle the work I left behind, I wasn't interested. And of course, even if they asked me to return to the company, I had no intention of doing so. However, they immediately began to apologize profoundly. They were even crying on my doorstep, begging for help. I decided to at least hear them out and invited them inside. Ingrid and Tanner were completely deflated. The pair who had once looked down on me now silent and heads bowed. The sight of this role reversal was amusing, but I held back my laughter. There was no rush to listen to their story. Just to be clear, I've quit the company, so you're just strangers to me now. But remember, I've recorded all your actions and words towards me. I told them, showing them the recordings on my mobile phone. This advice had come from Karen back when I was still employed, suggesting that recording could serve as evidence if needed. It turned out to be quite effective against the two. Stop! I was wrong! It was wrong of me to look down on people. That's not all, is it? You tried to sway the entire staff to your side by taking them to high-end stores, didn't you? Ingrid looked surprised and wide-eyed, as if to say, how did you know about that? I couldn't gather solid evidence, but I managed to hear a story from one of the employees, which I recorded. The employee, a man, told me he went out to dinner because Ingrid seduced him with her charm. Being single, he had some expectations, but they just disbanded right after the meal. Without any progress, Ingrid got a raise, and he felt he hadn't grown at all, which disappointed him. There were rumors of other men involved with Ingrid. Such stories seemed to have become somewhat of a rumor. When I explained all this, Ingrid was too shocked to say anything. Tanner, on the other hand, was the one unable to contain his anger, shouting about the presence of other men. I coldly retorted, You're one to talk. Tanner's assignment to our company was due to his philandering being exposed at his previous job. It was meant to cool him down, sending him to a male-dominated sales department. But his penchant for women only flourished. It was only a matter of time before the president would hear of it. I knew this from a conversation I had with the president, which I also recorded. After playing all my recordings to them, they sat in silence. However, I had something I wanted to ask. So, what do you want exactly? Surprised by my question, they shifted uncomfortably. Tanner spoke up for a mute Ingrid. We're in trouble without a hiring manager. So, we were hoping, you know, you'd come back. No way. It's your job now. I've already found another place to work starting today. You can't demand anything from a former employee, right? Resignation is a right given to employees. If they tried to take that right away, I'd have to act against them as a black company. Upon hearing this, they pleaded. Please, not that. In panic. I yelled for them to leave and chased them out. I didn't want anything to do with them anymore. Healing the wounds they caused me would be difficult. Closing the door, I let out a deep sigh of relief. Tears welling up as I finally felt it was over. Then, the male employee who helped with the recording contacted me. 
Ingrid and Tanner went back to the company and apparently sought out the president, asking for their managerial and executive roles to be revoked. They confessed everything, expressing concern for me. The previous boss was the current president, who had expressed concern for my health. Promptly, new supervisors and executives were appointed from among other employees. The president mentioned that moving forward, care would be taken to ensure work could be done more peacefully. This was communicated to all employees by the president during a morning meeting, leading me to be certain of its truth. Ingrid and Tanner, now demoted to regular employees, were working hard. Tanner, back to being an employee for the first time in a while, admitted he hadn't realized how hard it was. Looking down on people is a lesson learned the hard way, what goes around comes around. Being serious about work is not only natural but crucial. Later, I became responsible for cleaning at the hotel. When I expressed a desire to try something different from sales, Karen readily agreed. Sarah joined me, becoming the face of the hotel at the reception. Karen's husband, a chef, had several apprentices, making a team of five. Tasting their cooking, I thought it was heavenly. As we settled into dorm life, Sarah and I found ourselves discussing more positive topics. Enjoying the smiles of our guests made this job the most comforting. Sarah said, I'm glad for you. For Sarah, my happiness was all that mattered. Wanting to support me and be a confidant forever. You're no longer needed. We're getting a divorce. As soon as $200,000 of severance pay came through, my husband William suddenly brought up divorce. Understood. Let's get a divorce. What? After that, I was determined to make my husband's life a living hell. I, Olivia, am 67 years old. My late dad ran a company, and I was brought up without want as the daughter of a president from a young age. At that time, not as many people went to college, and I was no exception, going to a junior college. After graduating from junior college, dad brought up the topic of marriage. The partner was the son of the then executive vice president of dad's company, William, who was two years younger than me. I had never considered marriage, but out of respect for dad, I agreed to at least meet William. The William the first met for the first time on the day of the meeting was a fine young man with a kind smile inherited from the executive vice president. William was still only 20 years old at the time. However, his stories of working at a local company after high school graduation were very exciting to me, who only knew student life. He knew so much more than me, and William seemed reliable and shining. Thus, within half a year from the marriage talks I was initially not keen on, we smoothly got married. Shortly thereafter, William switched jobs to dad's company, and though he struggled with the change in job type, he worked hard. Our three children, now adults, have each started their own families and live independently. With the children having left the nest, our house felt suddenly spacious, and I was enjoying living just with William again after a long time. Now, with dad gone and the company entrusted to reliable people, William, who had worked there for 45 years thanks to dad, was finally facing mandatory retirement this year. Thanks to his long service, once the severance pay is out, we had planned to go on a trip to a hot spring or something. And on William's last day of work, I was busy preparing to celebrate grandly with our children invited. Wow, Mom, you really went all out with the cooking. Dad's retiring, huh? Gotta find a hobby so he doesn't get old and bored. Grandpa's going to have every day off now? That's nice. Our eldest daughter even brought her children, making it a lively wait for William's return. However, the guest of honor didn't come back, no matter how late it got. As it got late and we couldn't reach him, we decided to disband for the night, calming the worried children by suggesting he might be celebrating with his co-workers. I felt bad for the sons who drove here after work, but I sent them off with the prepared food as souvenirs, saying, Let's celebrate together again properly another time. Alone at home, I stared at the phone for ages, but still no contact. 
I continued to wait in the living room for William's return, but he didn't come home even by morning. Messages of concern kept coming from the children. With the situation unchanged, I gave up replying to those messages and tried calling William again. The phone rang a long time. Could it really be something? Thinking this, I made the fourth call, and finally, the phone connected. Olivia, you're really persistent. The voice on the other end of the phone was William's, sounding slightly annoyed. Hello? That's good, everyone's worried. Where are you? I told him about trying to celebrate his retirement yesterday with the children gathered and how we were worried because we couldn't contact him. Without even a murmur to indicate he was listening, I couldn't help but ask his whereabouts again. So, where are you? You wouldn't know. I've retired from my job now, and I've decided to live freely, so I rented a new place. What? You rented a place? William's unexpected words made me ask again. Then, William started laughing over the phone. I'll tell you now, why do you think I married you? To get into your dad's company and take the good parts, obviously. Though it was unexpected for me that your dad didn't give me the president's seat but to someone else. Despite all the effort I put in to please him, that's rough. After 45 years of marriage, the true nature of the man I had been with was so vile. I felt dizzy. Angered at how he belittled dad, I opened my mouth to say something. But cutting me off, William continued smugly. Well, me who didn't go to college and joined a small company, managed to climb up to executive vice president by marrying you. I did well. You and your dad have served me well. To think you always thought that way. You're the worst. Driven by frustration and disbelief, I found myself uttering disparaging words to William for the first time in our marriage. Words I had never allowed myself to say no matter how angry I was with him. Yet William seemed utterly unconcerned by my words. The worse, the better. I'm in a good mood now, with a new place without you and $200,000 of severance pay in hand. Then, with an exaggerated cough, he stated clearly. Meaning, you're no longer needed. We're getting a divorce. I could just imagine William's smug face as he said this over the phone. It would be a lie to say I wasn't furious. However, now that he had brought up divorce, I was only too happy to agree, as if fortune had finally turned my way. Understood. Let's get a divorce. What? My response seemed to surprise him as he asked again in a strange voice. Divorce is fine. Should I send the divorce papers, or will you come back to sign them?" William seemed taken aback by my calm response but quickly regained his bravado. I don't ever want to see your face again. I'll give you the address, so send them. I replied to William's spiteful comment and noted down the address. Indeed, it was in a completely different area, neither his hometown nor where we lived. He had apparently rented a house on entirely new ground. Later, I sent the divorce papers with my signature to William's new house. A few days later, a notification that the divorce papers had been processed arrived at our home. Knowing the divorce was finalized brought a certain relief to my chest. Then, as if timed, a call came. Hello? As expected, it was my now ex-husband, William, on the line. Did you get the notification too? Now that we're officially strangers, I thought we should settle the financial matters properly. All I ever received was a set amount for living expenses, you were the one managing everything. There were no valuables like debit cards left at the house, William must have everything by now. I wondered if a divorce like this meant splitting everything in half, as I organized my thoughts. I'm aware of that. William prefaced. The mortgage on the house is paid off, and since you're living there, you can have it. There won't be any other distribution of property, so do whatever you want with the house. 
No distribution of property? What about the savings and the severance pay? There are no savings, that's why I'm giving you the house. Be grateful. Whether there truly were no savings, I didn't know, but this way, William had managed to abscond with the entire $200,000 of his severance pay. Two and a half years after these events, I continued to live quietly in the house I was given, avoiding any contact with my ex-husband. My children, upon hearing the details of the divorce, were furious, suggesting I confront dad or consult a lawyer. But I thanked them and insisted I wanted to live quietly now. It took quite an effort to calm their anger, but recently, my ex-husband is no longer a topic of conversation. And today, my phone has been ringing off the hook since morning. Even without answering, I knew it must be William. Because, after two and a half years post-divorce, I had finally begun my revenge on William. He must be growing increasingly irritated by now. I decided to finally pick up the phone as the calls started coming in more frequently. Did it finally reach you? Sorry to keep you waiting. Immediately after confirming the caller, I delivered the line I had been holding onto for so long. I'm claiming compensation for infidelity during our marriage. Indeed, William had been having an affair with a subordinate at his company just before his retirement. I had learned of this and immediately began gathering evidence, planning to divorce after his retirement. However, conveniently for him, William hid his affair and initiated the divorce, leaving behind an old house while taking all the severance pay. While the divorce itself was somewhat expected, I was determined to make him pay for his selfish and cowardly actions until the very end. Now, being able to claim compensation from both him and his affair partner, I felt an inappropriate thrill that the start had finally begun. William, on the other end of the phone. It's been over two years since we divorced, there's no way you can claim compensation. Sounded irritated. However, I had already consulted a lawyer and sent a certified letter to both of them. Compensation for infidelity can be claimed within three years of becoming aware of the fact. I explained this to him carefully and in detail. William and his affair partner, confident they had managed to hide their secret or perhaps complacent about the impending divorce, had inadvertently provided ample evidence in a short period when investigated. Thus. Because the investigation period was short, even two and a half years after the divorce, there was still ample time to claim compensation. I had been waiting for this moment. The claim was for $60,000 each from both of them, citing repeated infidelity despite having three children with me and the other woman knowing William was married. I got the claim, so discuss it with your wife and contact my lawyer next time, not me. I'm not paying for something that happened so long ago. I ignored William's ranting and hung up the phone. Since then, I had set William's number and unknown numbers to silent, but one day, William suddenly showed up at my house. I happened upon him standing dumbfounded in front of the entrance as I returned from shopping. Seeing me, William looked from the house to me and was taken aback. Did you rebuild this place? He seemed surprised by the newly renovated look of our house. What does it matter to you now? I said, ignoring him and trying to enter the house. Then, William raised his voice. As if remembering something. I'm not going to pay any compensation, just so you know. He began to make a scene in front of the entrance. Concerned about the neighbor's eyes, I reluctantly let him in. Let's talk inside. Once inside, William rudely looked around the room. To interrupt his unpleasant gaze. I spoke up. It's been renovated nicely, right? I had a full remodel done right after you left. Ha? Huh? Where did you get the money? There's no way a housewife like you could afford such an amount. William instantly flew into a rage, demanding to know where the money came from. His quick temper hadn't changed since we were married. 
Feeling no need to hide it, I honestly told him that I had long been the owner of real estate passed down from dad. Then, William's demeanor changed, demanding his share. If you had that income during our marriage, it should be part of the property distribution. I'll calculate and claim half of it. Actually, since you hid it from me, I'll add a 20% delinquency charge. I was appalled by his greed, but explained patiently. Look, you can only claim distribution of property within two years after a divorce. That right has long expired. You can rent all you want, but legally, you can't claim it, and I'm not obligated to comply. Hearing this, William slammed the table and stood up then snorted and spoke with a face as if he was convinced of victory. Keep talking. I have my plans too. And so, he left without further discussion about the compensation. Later, William came for a discussion with his new wife, the former affair partner, and a lawyer. His plan, it seemed, was to employ professional help as I had. However, as expected, he was advised that a property distribution claim was no longer possible, so they decided to negotiate reducing the compensation for the affair. Don't think everything will go your way. I'm not paying you anything. In truth, William was trying to get out of paying altogether, but after both lawyers painstakingly explained the validity of the compensation, even his own lawyer admitted that avoiding payment was impossible given the evidence. Frustrated that his lawyer also agreed payment was unavoidable, William and his affair partner changed lawyers, only to receive the same advice. After prolonged discussions, William's side finally proposed to reduce the compensation. I accepted the offer, knowing that I had initially inflated the claim amount, anticipating a reduction. The settled amount didn't meet my original claim, but I had always earned more than William even before retirement. And my finances were stable, so the reduction didn't bother me. Moreover, I had been periodically checking on the two of them after the divorce, and this claim was timed and calculated based on their situation. Investigating their lives was easy with the address obtained during the divorce filing, allowing a detective to quickly gather information. Knowing they had likely spent the severance pay and were saving for a car through their jobs, I compromised on an amount that would just require them to hand over their savings. William accused me of being wicked, but I was determined to bring him and his affair partner down for my dad, myself, and my life. Thus, I was satisfied with the outcome. Securing my finances at an opportune time. Later, William and his partner had to pay a significant amount in compensation, though reduced. My estimate might have been off, or they truly had nothing left, as their savings for a car weren't enough. They moved to a cheaper apartment and continued to make payments while bickering. Watching them fall into despair, I might indeed be malicious. As I felt utterly liberated. Having sold the renovated house, I now live in a high-rise condo closer to my children's homes, enjoying every day to the fullest. Here is your dinner, Abigail. Nan, my M.I.L., laughed as she placed a broth without any ingredients in front of me. While my husband and in-laws were enjoying a luxurious steak, this was all I got. Next to me, stunned by Nan's treatment, my husband was rolling on the floor laughing. But today, I had made a certain resolution. My name is Abigail. I'm 27 years old. My mom passed away due to illness when I was in middle school, and since then, my dad raised me alone. Dad owns a small business in the manufacturing sector, and I help out with his work on a part-time basis. I have a husband named Daniel, who is three years older than me. Daniel is a salesman for one of my dad's clients. We hit it off immediately after meeting and gradually progressed in our relationship, getting married last year. The wedding was a small affair, attended only by close family and friends, but it was very much in line with what we wanted. Currently, 
We live in an apartment within walking distance from my childhood home. We had been building a good relationship with my in-laws, who live an hour and a half away by bus, but since getting married, they have gradually started to look down on my dad and me. Abigail's dad's company wouldn't survive without Daniel. I wish you'd show more gratitude to Daniel. They'd calmly say such outrageous things to me. How many times have they told me that my dad's business only exists because Daniel's company does business with us and that I should be more grateful to Daniel? Initially, I kept this from my dad, but one day, I ended up complaining in front of him and he found out. Dad told me to get a divorce, but the truth was, without Daniel's company, my dad's business would face severe difficulties, so I chose to endure for my dad's sake. At first, Daniel protected me from his parents' verbal abuse. Don't worry about it. Telling me. However, after constantly being told by the in-laws that Daniel is above Abigail since he married her. He unconsciously started to take a superior stance over me. And gradually, he became more arrogant, now often making snide remarks and acting haughtily. The kind Daniel I met at the beginning is gone. Amidst all this, we decided to visit the in-law's house for the upcoming long weekend. When we arrived at the in-law's house by train, they welcomed us at the entrance, but Daniel. Welcome. We've been waiting for you. Ah, Daniel. Good to see you. You must be tired. I knew it, but the in-laws welcomed only my husband, treating me as if I didn't exist. I'm here too. Thanks for having us today. I managed the customary greeting, but the in-laws only talked to my husband, ignoring me. Still, I was about to start preparing dinner as always ordered, when Nan spoke to me. Ah, no need to prepare anything today. I ordered some luxurious steaks for dinner. Oh? Is that so? Thank you. It seems Nan had ordered steaks for delivery, so I moved from the kitchen to the living room. High quality steak, it's been a while. Daniel seemed to be in a good mood, relaxing. As I was thinking it was about dinner time, the doorbell rang, and Nan went to receive the delivery. She started placing the steaks on the table, but to my shock, there were only three servings. Luxurious steaks were placed in front of Fael John, my husband, and Nan. What about my portion? Abigail's dinner is this. Eh? What Nan placed in front of me was a soup without any ingredients. It's from yesterday. We ate all the ingredients yesterday, so it's just the broth. Nan laughed loudly. John and my husband also burst into laughter. What's so funny, my husband was laughing so hard he was having trouble breathing. Silent, I was stunned as Nan, laughing condescendingly, uttered unbelievable words. Your poor bottom of the barrel company should just shut down already. This ingredient-less soup is enough for a poor person like you. Nan's ugly laughing face. To that. This is the last time I'll be meeting with you, so I don't care. I said. What do you mean? Ignoring the surprised Nan, I took out a certain document from my bag and thrust it towards Daniel. What's this? Divorce papers. I've already signed, so can you just sign them quickly? Caught off guard by my actions, Daniel stared at the divorce papers for a few seconds before. Why all of a sudden? It's true that Dad's company isn't doing well. Don't get mad. He tried to reason with me. Continuing. You usually don't talk back no matter what's said. What's gotten into you today? He asked. I'm tired of putting up with it. You don't need a poor man's wife either, do you? I coldly informed him. Huh? What are you talking about? My husband showed a puzzled look. To such a husband, the in-laws chimed in. That's right, that's right. No need for a poor man's wife. Just get a divorce. 
they incited. Daniel hesitated for a while but, under the pressure of the in-law's momentum, signed the divorce papers. I took the divorce papers and silently left the in-law's house. I went straight to the office to submit the divorce papers, and with that, my divorce from Daniel was officially finalized. Feeling relieved, I returned home, took the luggage I had packed in advance, and went back to my parents' house. In fact, I had been considering divorce for a while, which is why I had packed my bags. Daniel had no idea I was preparing to leave. He had been indifferent to me lately and probably never dreamed that I was considering divorce. Back at my parents' house, I told Dad about what happened at the in-law's house and reported that I had divorced Daniel. Dad offered me words of consolation and told me I could stay at home as long as I wanted. The next morning, Daniel, who had returned from the in-law's house, called me several times, but I ignored all of them. Daniel came to Dad's company as part of his rounds, but Dad, knowing the whole situation, was furious and tried to send Daniel away. Angered by Dad's attitude, Daniel yelled, Then the deal is off! and broke the contract and left. Dad and I blocked Daniel and his parents' phone numbers and handled all matters related to the distribution of property after the divorce through a lawyer. I never wanted to see Daniel or the in-laws again. The lawyer was competent and handled the proceedings efficiently, which was a great help. After a while, the lawyer contacted me to say that Daniel had come up with something outrageous. He said he would consider reconciling if I apologized. What a joke. He doesn't seem to realize he's the one who got divorced. I absolutely refused to reconcile. Of course, I decided to ignore it. Then, Daniel started hinting at reviving the business dealings with Dad's company as a condition for reconciliation. If you reconcile, I'll revive the dealings with Dad's company. Daniel seemed to think I would agree to reconcile immediately if he hinted at reviving Dad's company's dealings, but Dad and I ignored this as well. As Dad and I didn't agree no matter how long it took, Daniel came to Dad's company to talk directly. However, he was stunned upon seeing the sign. Eh? What's with this sign? Instead of Dad's company's sign, it had changed to a web design company's sign. Dad had been considering closing down the company due to financial difficulties. After many discussions and consultations between Dad and me, Dad decided to close the business and use the store as my new business office. In fact, my main profession is a web designer. Working at Dad's store was just helping out. That's why I worked there part-time, not as a full-time employee. While working as a web designer, I also helped with Dad's company's work all along. Since Dad closed the company, naturally, there was no need for dealings with Daniel's company. There's no need to request business dealings anew as my work has nothing to do with Daniel's company. Hey! Abigail, you're there, right? Why has the sign changed? What happened to your Dad's company? Daniel was yelling in front of my company's sign. Come out, Abigail! Initially, I ignored him, but he kept shouting and wouldn't leave. To avoid causing a nuisance to the neighbors, I reluctantly showed myself. Keep it down. Please go home. Finally, you come out. Explain. What happened to Dad's company? Daniel demanded an explanation. It's obvious, isn't it? Dad's company closed down. The store is being used as my web design office now. When I explained, Daniel scoffed as if mocking me. Huh? Being a web designer is such an unstable job. It's going to be tough going forward. I'll reconcile and take care of you. How much more is this man going to belittle me? What are you talking about? I refuse. When I naturally refused. Why not? Daniel got furious and started causing a scene again. Fed up with Daniel's bizarre tantrum, 
I finally called the police. Soon after, the police arrived and escorted Daniel out. Until the end. Hey, you'll regret not reconciling with me. I'm saying I'll reconcile, so just accept it. Daniel was shouting. Why is he so obsessed with reconciling? There's no point in reconciling with a wife he mocked for being poor now that he's gotten a divorce. Feeling the oddity of Daniel's actions, I immediately set out to investigate why he was so insistent on reconciling. Then, a shocking truth was revealed. Daniel had been fired from his company. In fact, Dad had built such a good relationship with the president of Daniel's company, based on past achievements, that he was considered a go-to person in times of trouble. Therefore, when Daniel and I got married, the president and others were pleased, but they were furious when they found out Daniel had unilaterally terminated the contract with Dad's company due to his own divorce drama. Unable to take responsibility, Daniel was fired and was trying to get rehired by remarrying me to mediate between dad and the company. So that's why he was demanding reconciliation so insistently. I was dumbfounded. Upon learning this, dad and I immediately reported Daniel's nuisance behavior to his company. We made sure Daniel was warned not to come near me and dad again. This made Daniel's reemployment hopeless. Am I really never going back to the company, unemployed, me? Proud Daniel couldn't accept reality and seemed to have been living a reclusive life for a while. Eventually, as his savings began to run out, Daniel found it difficult to continue paying the rent for the apartment we used to live in by himself and fled back to his parents' house. Poor Daniel. Forget about such an ungrateful wife. You can stay here as long as you like. Daniel's parents welcomed him back home and seemed to accept him. They are apparently doting on Daniel and taking care of him. My new business, having secured a dedicated workspace in the form of a storefront, is off to a smooth start with increased efficiency. Having a physical store seems to offer a sense of security, allowing me to connect with people and local shops I hadn't been involved with before. Word of mouth is gradually increasing my customer base, and I'm enjoying my work every day. Dad is still young, so he looked for a new job and was hired by a factory that was a business partner of the company Daniel used to work for, based on his track record. The factory is large, with many people working there. Friendly and competent, Dad quickly became well acquainted with his colleagues and seems to enjoy working in a large group. I make sandwiches for dad every day, and one time when dad forgot his sandwich, I delivered it and was happy to see dad working lively and smiling. Everyone working in the factory seems nice. They respect each other, sharing their skills, knowledge, and experience generously to achieve better results. Inspired by dad, I vowed to work hard at my job too. Meanwhile, after returning to his parents' house, Daniel attempted to find a job but seemed to fail at every turn and ended up feeling defeated. Daniel's parents consoled him. How pitiful. The companies that don't hire Daniel just don't see his worth. Yeah, exactly. It's like everyone's just messing around. I'm offering to work and they dare not hire me. Daniel isn't at fault. Take your time looking for a job. Even after that, Daniel took several employment exams but failed miserably. Despite having an average education and work history, he couldn't even pass the document screening because he was aiming too high. Stressed from unsuccessful job hunting, Daniel started frequenting slot machines and eventually ended up in debt. Every day, unemployed Daniel lazed around at home not helping with housework and going to slot machines. Initially, Daniel's parents spoiled him endlessly, but they eventually ran out of patience with his lack of initiative to work and constant slot machine visits. We can't take care of an unemployed person. Get out. They yelled at Daniel, turning against him, but Daniel retorted. 
Didn't you say I could stay as long as I liked? What's this all of a sudden? I'm not leaving. And they seem to argue frequently. Even when told to at least help with housework, Daniel does nothing and lazes around. He frequently orders pizza and steak for delivery with his parents' money, significantly increasing the food expenses. He would also finish all the food in the refrigerator at night. Continuing such a lifestyle, he became increasingly overweight and unhealthy. I think Daniel's parents are partly to blame for Daniel becoming like this, but they don't seem to realize it at all. They act as if they're victims of a good-for-nothing son. The neighbors talk, making their lives very uncomfortable. That family harassed their wife until she left, and their son got fired and came back unemployed. Sometimes, the parent-child arguments are so intense that the sound of breaking dishes can be heard. Noise complaints have led to the police being called several times, and they've been warned. Daniel's debt only grew, leading him to buy a large number of lottery tickets as a last resort, which, of course, didn't win, causing debt collectors to start showing up at his house. Finally realizing he needed to earn money, Daniel, thinking it would be easy, applied for and got a part-time job at a grocery store. However, the part-time job at the grocery store was tens of times harder than Daniel had imagined, with a wide range of tasks. Underestimating the grocery store part-time job, Daniel struggled significantly. He worked there, being scolded by student part-timers, but somehow managed to keep the job. I happened to pass by the grocery store recently and saw Daniel working there, looking nothing like his former self, filled with confidence. Now, he looked downcast, dark, overweight, and disheveled, almost like a different person. I muttered to myself that it was his responsibility, feeling refreshed. I thought I was done with love, but thanks to a friend's introduction, I recently started dating a sincere man. I introduced him to Dad, and Dad seems to like him very much. We're planning a trip together, which I'm really looking forward to. Divorcing Daniel was truly the best decision. I'm living a very fulfilling and happy life, both personally and professionally.